Good evening and live from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, the sun and fun capital of the world. This is Dr. John Stamey, and I wanted to welcome everyone to a very special edition of ScaryCast. We've got an incredible um, guest, some incredible people that are going to be questioning our guest. And first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Brad Mulder. How are you doing tonight, Brad? Our newest Scary Caster. Oh, I am doing fine. Cannot complain. I've uh, just uh, having inter- interesting conversations with interesting people. That's all. Nothing more. Plus, making well, that's, uh, that's all. Those- we're, that's all we're about is interesting conversations with interesting people. And I like that phrase. It, it makes a lot of sense. That's what Scary Cast is about. So we're so happy to have you. And from one of the most frightening towns in America. The home of the Masters, Chris Chastain. How are you doing tonight, Chris? Good evening, John. I'm doing good. Um, as I always say, my favorite night of the week. Always happy to learn something new and, uh, as Brad said, have some good conversation. Keep it spooky. Well, that's great. We're, we're glad to have you here tonight on ScaryCast, this very special version. And tonight, we have from Washington State one of the most celebrated and interesting individuals that we ever have on ScaryCast, the one and only Mark Sargent of the Flat Earth Society. Mark Sargent, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. And I'd like to correct you up front. Uh, Technically, I do not represent the Flat Earth Society. Uh, I'm just a Flat Earth advocate. Uh, The Flat Earth Society is its completely own entity, has nothing to do with the the mainstream media and social media stuff that we do now. So there you go. Okay, well, well, that's okay. And I I apologize. No, 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 no. Corrected me on that. That's right. But but let's say you, you are truly a Flat Earth advocate and a very, very interesting person. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. So tonight. We're going to be asking you questions, and, uh, and, and they're very interesting. I love the idea of the flat earth. It's something that, that a lot of us really do like. Uh, we like the idea of it. We want to know more about it. So first of all, tell us what you know and what you advocate sure. about the flat earth. You yeah, yeah. So the nickel tour would be this. Uh, you are told or have been told since you were old enough to be in school, say six years old, uh, that you live on a tiny little rock that's covered with a little bit of water and even a smaller amount of air or atmosphere. And you are flying through an impossibly huge universe uh, left over from the Big Bang. And that this world is meaningless. It's insignificant. Your life is nothing. And it's all pointless. There is no, there is no relevance to it. Uh, we come in and we say, no, no. And you're, not, you're not living on some tiny little rock in space. Why would there be space at all? You're living in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Uh, and it was built by a creator. And you are living inside it and it was built just for you. And the planets and the sun and the moon are just an ornamental clock that predates language, just lights on a ceiling. And that's what I've been doing for the last eight years. I I put that out there and and thought that it would get shut down immediately, made a series of videos called The Flat Earth Clues back in 2015. And here we are eight years later, two books, a Netflix documentary, I don't know how many conferences, I, I... don't even couldn't you begin to tell you how many meetups or interviews I've done and uh, it's been a wild ride so there you go well that is very very interesting because you have some very compelling evidence and uh, we want to talk about that tonight so I I think that's the most interesting thing so our first questioner is Dr. Brad Mulder radionics expert he is an expert he's got these wonderful machines and they do work and we'll talk more about that later on but dr brad Mulder, the first question is yours of mark Sargent. okay well first off 
I think on the last show I I said that I'm I'm really indifferent about this. I uh, you know I'm you know I'm I'm not convinced either way whether it's a flat Earth or whether we're living on a ball. I'm I'm very open minded to any possibility about this. With that said, um, I have a good friend of mine who's also an engineer in uh, communications, and he was telling me about well, yes, we do have satellites. They do orbit around the uh, planet. As he, you know, as he put it, he says, "I can prove it to you with uh, trigonometry by simply uh, using simple mathematics. I can prove to you that that these satellites are, I think, twenty three. I think he says it's like twenty three thousand miles up in space, if memory serves. Mm. And so, you know, yeah, that's what I'm, you know, that's this is what I'm getting from him. And uh, you know, he even said, "Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, back in the old days, when we had these giant." Uh, you know, satellite dishes in the, in, you know, people's backyards uh, that, uh, you know, as the satellite would travel, the dishes would track that satellite. Okay, you would notice the satellite would, you know, would uh, automatically uh, tilt at a certain angle in order to be able to, uh, you know, hone in onto that particular satellite and pick up the signal. Now, my question is, I really don't know how to put this uh, in the right way. How can you basically con- or counteract that or, or uh, tell him where he's wrong sure. uh, about this? Sure. About the, okay. Yeah, yeah no, I can. I can do. I get that question all the time. You know, what? What about satellites, Mark? Do you believe in satellites? Yeah, yeah, I do believe in satellites. I, I do think we we put things up there. However, in the eight years that we've been doing this, and when we've been digging a lot, we uncovered not secret, not classified information uh, about the NASA high altitude balloon program. That's been going on since the late 50s. NASA, by the way, is currently the largest consumer of helium in the world and probably the largest producer as well. I'm pretty sure they, they bought out the, the most of the big companies that are they're tied to, to helium manufacturing because they launch hundreds of balloons every week uh, with massive payloads most of the time. In fact, I, do I believe in satellites? Yes. 95% of them are sent up on balloons. NASA won't even argue at this point. Uh, they can take payloads as as heavy as I think four tons, eight thousand pounds, which is way heavier than just about any satellite that's ever been claimed to have been put on a rocket. And it, you know they're not like weather balloons. When you go up to a certain altitude, you can manage their altitude, and so they don't burst. And you can keep them up there for a very very long time because there's nothing else up there, you know, except for other you know slow moving satellites, you know, on balloons. And that's that's all you do. Uh, and as far as most of the bandwidth, the, you know what we're talking to down here, that is still old school. Uh, that is that is undersea cables, which started out as telegraph, then changed to telephone, then changed to fiber optic. You know the the old tricks are the best tricks, and you just take you know huge ships with massive amounts of cables and connect it once, and then upgrade over a series of decades, and that's all you needed. As far as as far as the trigonometry, yeah, math isn't going to save them. And and by the way, math is one of the reasons that uh, we do so well in social media. Because as you know, when you're growing up in school, and I'm not trying to to be offensive to to the nerds and geeks out there, because I used to be one. Uh, it was look look the math club is very very small, <laughs> and the physics club is really really small. It's yeah, same with the audiovisual club and the, and that sort of things. And most of our audience, most of the people we meet at conferences and meetups, they weren't in the phys- physics club or the math club. You throw a trigonometry at them, you might as well be speaking Greek, literally. So there you go. So satellites, do I believe in them? Yes, I do. Do I believe they're as advertised? No, I don't. Uh, and NASA is really good at omitting things. Like, oh yeah, by the way, we launch again. You can, there's videos out there, wonderful videos I've, on my channel. One, you know, you don't, they, in fact, they only show the big heavy um, balloon payloads when they crash. Uh, one of the 8,000 pounders caught a stiff breeze because they launched most of them from uh, um, Australia. And it just, you know, went sideways and just totaled an SUV because it had so much more mass to it. And anyway, so I know we have more questions. So go on. All right. Well, that that's very cool, Doctor Mulder. Do you have any more questions at this moment? Okay. Um, another uh, thing that was brought to my attention concerning, you know, um, I think we we all believe that uh, the you know the the uh, I think Polaris does not move. It's always stationary. It's, it's always is at the same position in the sky. Yep. 
It never changes. It never will. Okay. Now, uh, there's, you know, a coral castle down in Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the uh, eccentric gentleman that built that, that giant little complex uh, down there, um, he had a uh, basically a rock where he drilled a hole in it, and he put uh, basically crosshairs out of pieces of wire. And what it and the way he had it set up was that uh, it's pointed right at Polaris. You could look through the, this whole uh, peephole, and you're looking right at Polaris, you're looking right at the North Star. Mm -hmm. And as you do this, as the seasons change, it, it is divided in four quarters. Is, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, it four, you know, like I said, four quarters. As the seasons change, that star will shift into a different quarter. Okay, okay? it will actually. Uh, rotate within that, you know, within that uh, that uh, hole that you know where you're able to view it. Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you: Do you consider this evidence that uh, that uh, that star is stationary? I mean, that seems to be the one thing that, uh, from what I can tell, you know, from watching a lot of the shows, that seems to be the one thing everybody kind of you know grabs onto or gravitates to. Well, uh, yeah, you know, all these other stars are moving, but this one's stationary. Well, in reality, it, it may be. Stationary, it's in the same general position, but it is rotating, even though it's very slight. Right. I, it's not, you know, I have never used Polaris in any of my examples. When people say, oh, you know, what are your top ten flatter things? I've, I've never used Polaris. I, I mean, yes, relatively speaking, sure, it doesn't move compared to the rest of the objects up there. Uh, you know, does that prove that, that, the, uh, uh, that it's a flat earth? No. No, there's lots of things that, that don't prove a flat Earth, but it doesn't hurt us either, necessarily. Because again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, uh, you know, everything up in the sky, everything, I don't care what it is, stars, planets, sun, moon, meteors, whatever, it is just, again, part, it is just ornaments. It's it's a giant ornamental clock system. That's, that's all it really is. Signs and wonders, you know, greater light for the day, lesser light for the night, that sort of thing. So Polaris, it's like, eh. I mean, you got to remember that I also, the, the tougher question, which most people don't bring up, well, there's two tougher questions. One would be at the equator, if you do time-lapse photography, do you see the stars rotating in, uh, you know, in counter, um, clock, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise rotation at the equator? Yeah, you do in time-lapse. Uh, and, of course, we can do that now in, in simulation or using any sort of projection. We can absolutely do that. But it does, does it do that at the equator? Yes, it does. Um, or the big one, you know, people say, well, you know, what's the weakest thing in the sky? You know, the argument for the flat Earth. Mine would be the uh, the 24-hour Antarctic sun. Because if our map is, you know, a dinner plate with the North Pole at the center and Antarctica stretching out all the way around us, you know, like a like a giant uh, edge of a, of a lake, then 24-hour sun in the center works, but 24-hour sun in Antarctica doesn't unless there's multiple light sources. But since no one's really allowed to go down there for any long periods of time except for military and military scientists, you know, yes, the tourists can go down there. And I've had friends that have said, oh, yeah, I've seen 24-hour sun, but most of the footage we get from there doesn't show 24-hour sun. So I think that's more of a problematic thing. But again, for every one and every plot hole we have, there's at least a dozen on the other side. There you go. That's my little rant. Interesting. Okay. Very interesting. All right, Doctor Mulder, did, did did we get get an answer there? Does that kind of help? Uh, yes, I think it helps. I mean, I had to, you know, since you kind of, you know, steered into it. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that above the equator, uh, if you were to let water <clears throat> go down a sink, it will go, I guess, clockwise? If you go below the equator, it will go counterclockwise. What is uh, the what? reasoning behind oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I'm, in fact, that's funny you mentioned that because I, I just went to a, a meetup in Los Angeles a couple of days ago, and somebody brought that up. And, uh, in fact, it was a math professor from, uh, from a Southern California University. And I said, you know what? Most of that legwork was done by someone who wasn't even a flat earther. There's a fantastic, huge YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. And he actually addressed that, and he got his friend to set up in Australia the exact. They set up identical kids' waiting pool with a center drain. All the materials were exactly the same. They made sure that everything was identical on both. You know the drain plugs. In fact, they didn't even disturb. They let the water sit for hours and hours and hours, and they didn't even disturb it with a boat. They used food coloring droplets, and they both you know hit these plungers you know you know to slowly drain the pool, and. 
the the spin was so amazingly gradual. He said, you know, at the end of the video, you can forward to the end if you guys want. Uh, it was it was almost non-existent. It might as well not have been there. So when, but the myth that we've heard over, it's like, oh, a toilet spin in op opposite direction, and sinks go in the opposite direction. No, it's just which way the water is going into the bowl, whatever it is. And yet, when you go to the equator, you can, you know, they, it's a tourist trap, which is, you know, they'll they'll move you this one spot. It's like, look, the water spins in the bowl this direction, and then they move three feet to the other side of this line. It's like, oh, look, it's going in the other direction at a really high rate of speed. It's like, uh, even if it was true. It's your what you're showing is so amazingly exaggerated. There's no way it could happen in that sort of distance between the two of each other. So it's just a myth that's been perpetuated for decades and decades. And of course, since nobody could check it, which is why the smarter everyday guy did. So again, I defer to him on that one. He did a far more expensive and more elaborate test than we could have ever come up with. And it showed that it was basically not there. So there you go. However, however, let me let me put a caveat on that. The the when it comes to southern hemisphere, I can't, I can't it's either hurricanes or cyclones supposedly spin in an opposite direction. If that's the case, I got no I got nothing for you there. But uh, you know, who knows? I mean, I'll I'll leave that up to to the the designer of this wonderful world. Okay, very interesting. All right, Professor Mulder, can we move to our next inquisitor? Please. Okay, good. Chris Chastain, do you have a question for Mark Sarge? I do. I do, Mark. Right. Um, so, so I, I'm I'm a bit of a flat Earth virgin. <laughs> but, um, uh, so not here, not are yeah. are you flat are you flat curious? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm not sure yet. <laughs> All right. So, um, but I'm 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 very open-minded. So, um, and very curious about this. So, okay. Um, I I was curious as to what got you into this. So, were you? Has this been uh, your belief for a long time, or kind of what was the catalyst? No, that, um, no, uh, no, it wasn't. Got you into flat Earth. Yeah, I, I was not into Flat Earth. Uh, nobody is. Nobody okay. is. The, the, the best part of Flat Earth is that everybody starts in the negative. They start in the hole, which is everybody hates it. Everybody's. I mean, I've talked to, mm -hmm. which is the, the first opening paragraph of my, my clues was, I've got friends that will tell you the British royal family are made up of lizard people. And I would go to him, mm -hmm. yeah, but what about flat earth? And you're like, get the hell out of here. And it's like, what are you talking about? You just <laughs> told me about lizard people. How, how is it that you're just, you're, you're treating me like I'm the crazy person? And that's, that's the attitude that most people uh, have. Um, back in 2014, uh, because I never got married or had kids, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And I, you know, and I was sure. there, I was there when the internet was new. I was there when you could finish the internet. Let's put it this way, back in, back in the day. Okay. And I was bored. I had looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of. And, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, I just finished the hollow earth theory and, and it's like, ah, it's fine. And, and it's like flat earth sitting over there. It's like, I don't want to look at this. I really, really don't. But you know what? I'm not getting any younger. So I'm going to. And I spent a weekend, I thought I could shoot it down. Uh, again, it was just really conspiracy boredom that got me into it. And I spent nine months, I was really stubborn. And I tried to come up with a way to demunk it. I mean, I, there's conspiracies I like, and there's conspiracies I don't, right? You know, I've looked at just, I have an opinion on just about mm -hmm. every conspiracy you could think of. You know, um, uh, you know, do I, do I think that JFK was a lone gunman? Eh, probably not. Do I, do I think that Bigfoot had Elvis's baby? I doubt it. I really, really doubt it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, but but at the same time, you know, someone could come to me now. It's like, hey, I got something to tell you about Bigfoot. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll give you a few minutes. I mean, what, what leg do I have to stand on? So anyway, I shot this, you know, shot this thing down for nine months, and I couldn't quite put it to bed. And so finally, uh, in February of uh, 2015, I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a series of videos and put myself out there. I'm going to put all my contact information out there. I'm going to dox myself. It's like, you know what? I can't prove the globe anymore, not in a court of law. 
So tell me where I went wrong. Mm-hmm. And you know, and and I really just held my breath, you know, waited for the other shoe to drop. And it never happened. Mm-hmm. In fact, people start contacting me immediately. What was weird was all these subject matter experts, you know, military people, um, air traffic controllers and engineers and, and um, just about every pilot you could, you know, type you could think of contacted me and said, yeah, man, it's not that crazy. Here's why. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, I really, really <laughs> didn't think we were going to be going with this, you know, keep this running. And, and then it just never stopped. Uh, it never, at, at no point... After the first six months, uh, the concrete had basically hardened to where I and I honestly I couldn't get into this. I couldn't even have made my first stuff unless I mean, I for those nine months that I was working on it, I was trying to figure out, OK, what question would I ask a flat earther? And I and then how would I answer that as a flat earther? And I went back and forth and back and forth to where I pretty I was pretty sure I had answered just about everything. And I, I was right. I got I had about 90 something percent of them. And then which is why, you know, by the time the like year two and year three came around, I wasn't getting new questions, you know, because the, the most the you know, people people tend are, are drawn to the obvious ones. So there you go. There's my origin. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, Chris, did, did, did he answer your question? He did. Um, and and I, I, had a, I had one more burning question, uh, if I could squeeze it in. No, I don't think so. Um, nope. Absolutely. Nope. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, I, and this, I mean, this is the first thing that popped into my head when, when I heard, you know, the phrase, you know, flat earth society or flat earth in general. But, yeah. You know, is there an edge to the earth? You probably have heard that question many, many times, but is there a fall off point? Not, okay, yeah, not a, uh, the Thor movies did us no favors whatsoever with that whole Asgard and cosmic waterfall (laughs) thing. Yeah, did, did not help us at all. The, uh, and, and, and honestly, I don't blame people, you know, the, the people, because people's first impression is, oh, it's a disc, but it's still in space. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why would it still be in space? Why is there? Why why would you think there's space? If the Earth is an illusion, you know, if the, if the globe is the illusion, you know, the illusion, then why would space be real? In fact, it would, doesn't even make sense. No different than what we do now when we simulate space, you know, for decades with planetariums, right? You sit on your back, you look at the, mm-hmm. you know, you get your eyes adjusted, you look at the stars and the moon, and it's like, oh, hey, look, there's the moon coming by. It's like, yeah, can you land on it? No, why? Yeah. Well, because it's just a big light on a ceiling. So if if the Earth is, is flat and enclosed, then, yeah, the edge would be the enclosure. So, again, however the, you as a human mind wants to rationalize it, you know, if you want to call it a snow globe, if you want to call, call it a fishbowl, if you want to call it a pizza box... Uh, a, a shallow sports stadium. You mean, I, I, most people know what a snow globe is, but the arc of a snow globe is really, really high, obviously, you know, so you can shake it around and yeah. do stuff. But it doesn't have to be that high because most of our civila- civilization lives really, really shallow compared to height, compared to width. So if, if this thing was, say, 20,000 miles wide, then the height of the dome wouldn't even have to be 5,000 miles or 3,000 miles, barely. In fact, most of that wouldn't even be used because, there are, you know, um, commercial airliners cap out at 10 miles, cap at 10 miles, spy planes, maybe twice that. So even if you had a ceiling, a hard ceiling at 50 miles, that'd be more than comfortable for our civilization. But then again, you got the space program and you got to figure out how to fake that because, you know, you don't want things running into, you know, the the, the barrier, as as we say. So there you go. So yes, there is there is an edge. Short version, there is an edge. Yes. Okay, as usual, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> but but is it though? I, I mean, I come on. But, but let me let me throw one more hint, thing in there really quick, which is come on. This is something we've talked about in you know in sci-fi novels. What I try to tell people is like, look, we've written a sci- science fiction version of this world for just about every different reality or potential reality or future or past reality or retro reality, everything we could possibly think of. Isn't it, isn't it logical that one of those would have been the winning lottery ticket? 
you know, somebody had it right because we've covered all the angles. It's just a question of who did it, you know, who got it right. And flat Earth is not also not a new concept. The ancient civilizations, again, you want to you want to have some fun. Type into Google ancient cosmologies and click on the images button. Everybody thought, even the Greeks, before they supposedly supposedly said it was curved, everybody drew the same thing. They all drew the same snow globe because they looked up in the sky. It's like, oh, look, the stars are going overhead. But they're not going over straight. They seem to be going over in some sort of curved trajectory. Hmm. You know, and then they followed them slowly. I mean, it was boring back then. And they all drew the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, stars and the sun and the moon are in this curved dome surface. So anyway, sorry. There you go. No, no, that, 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 that's, a, that's a great answer, I think. Now, Chris, did uh, Mark give you an answer that is reasonable? Oh, yes, more than enough. <laughs> he's not, he's not going to sleep. Yeah, he's not going to sleep. Right. <laughs> he's, he's not. Okay, all right, all right. Well, Mark, yeah. I've got an interesting question for you. Sure. Michael W. Smith, one of the great religious pop singers of all time yeah. wrote a song called Go West Young Man Let Evil Go East and I'm going to take off on that and I'm going to say in 1522 Magellan claimed to have circumnavigated the earth yeah. in, 15, in 1522 El Claw who was Spanish, again, claimed to have circumnavigated the earth. Right. In 1577 to 1580, Sir Francis Drake of Britain claimed to have circumnavigated the earth. And in 1598 to 1601, a, uh, a, a, a Nordic man named Van Nort claimed to have circumnavigated the earth. They all went west, right? And they came back to the same point, right? And I cannot wait to hear your answer to, the, to this question because I think it's I think it's an important question right. in the flat Earth. So, how does one circumnavigate the globe and it still be a flat Earth? Uh, pretty easy. One is uh, think of don't think of it as a globe. Think of it as a dinner plate. In fact. Just think of a dinner plate. If you take your finger on it and you move it in a circle, either clockwise or counterclockwise, it really doesn't matter, and you come back to the same point, technically you've circumnavigated that dinner plate. Does that make that dinner plate a globe? No, it does not. And you're saying, well, what about the compass? It's like, well, magnetic north is in the center, you know, like the, the center of a record, for those of you old enough to remember needles on a record and, you know, the center of the record. Um, but the compass, if you, in fact, if you put a compass in the middle of that dinner plate, and then, you know, I'm sorry, a magnetic thing in the middle of a dinner plate and move a compass around it, the compass will act exactly like it should. It's going to keep pointing north. Now, south is a little different, by the way, which is, uh, you're going to look this up also. You know, they've asked all sorts of people in Antarctica. It's like, it's like oh, hey, uh, what does a compass do uh, down in Antarctica? Nothing. doesn't do anything, which is really, really unusual. It's something we forget in school. It's like, you know, the, a bar magnet has north and south, right? So north dominates only for a certain, you know, once it gets to the equator, it should start dominating south. I've had Australian military guys say, yeah, but they called early on and said, yeah, dude, there, there is no south magnetic. It's just not there. Oh, yeah, there's a south silver pole stuck in the ice, which they take tourists to, but they don't necessarily encourage people to move a compass there. And uh, so anyway, as far as the north, anyone circumnavigating around a they're they're just circumnavigating a dinner plate it's all they're doing it's it works no differently than it does on a globe in fact perceptively because it's such a big place they'd never the they never even know their ship was was slightly veering if you're going you know, we'll say clockwise uh i'm sorry counterclockwise uh you know to your left or to your right the other way it's just so big you never notice it even planes don't notice it 
but that's just because of GPS, but that's a whole other thing. Remember, don't forget, GPS is not some civilian thing. That was designed by the United States military in the 90s. It's just left over from the Loran system. They slapped on uh, new letters, GPS, and it has nothing to do with 36 satellites up there. It is strictly Loran system, which is why, by the way, sorry, let me throw one more thing in there, that GPS absolutely fails when you get about 150, 200 miles away from uh, uh, from any other transmitter. So when you get out, it's like uh, if you're going from Africa to South America to Australia, you get out 200 uh, miles offshore. If there's no other islands next to you, your plane goes off the grid and it goes into an estimated or approximated mode, which should scare people a little bit because it's like, okay, we're just going to keep flying in that heading. You are completely off the grid until you get close to shore. Then they pick you up and you're saying, well, that can't happen everywhere. Oh, yeah, it does. There are no islands between here and Hawaii, for example. So when you leave California, heading off to Hawaii, there's several hours where you're not anywhere. They know approximately where you are, but they don't know exactly where you are because there there is no GPS system, that, that blanket coverage. But they don't tell you that. Anyway, sorry, go on. No, 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 that, 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 that's an excellent answer. Um, and, and I really appreciate that. Yeah. Because it's like, where are you? You're not anywhere. Yeah. You, the, um, now the, the you told us go ahead. Last, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Last time, last time that you were on our show, uh-huh. you told us that when somebody had a medical emergency on a plane, yeah, that they ended up in Alaska. Now, can you please explain that? Because I thought that was fascinating. Sure. When, uh, you know, the, this, all it takes is time and money to hide anything. And, and our government and some of the, the, the brass of other governments have, have done a wonderful job. But it's the emergencies that usually screw things up. And there's not that many of them on any given year. Uh, there's a wonderful book out there by one of our per- people called uh, 16 Emergency Landings on Flat Earth, I believe. Something to that effect. Uh, if, I, if I butchered it and he's listening, please forgive me. Um, but it shows that when a plane is, is going from point A to point B and they have to make an emergency stop, you know, somebody gets pregnant, somebody has a heart attack, somebody dies, something, something, they will veer off course and they will go off the planned GPS route. But where they go makes no, no apparent sense. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a globe, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, one of the finest examples would have been the, I think it was the Philippines to Los Angeles, which would have swung right next to Hawaii. I mean, right next to it. And when, uh, you know, a lady, I think was having a baby. And so they said, oh, we got to get her to the hospital. So instead of landing in Hawaii, you know, Hawaii with tons of different hospitals, you know, all, you know, far better healthcare, they diverted on a globe north to Alaska way out of their way if you're if you're looking at a globe but if you look at it on a flat earth map you know which is dinner plate it's going right by alaska you know and and again the pilots can't see the forest for the trees and even if they did notice something that the last first off the last thing they would ever think is flat earth and even if they did say flat earth who are they going to tell you know you know i've i've had pilots come to me confidentially and said oh dude i'm totally with you Oh yeah, don't use my name <laughs> because because they'd get fired. I mean, if you're if you're <laughs> if you're a pilot, you even say you were chased by a UFO, you know, you're done. You're benched because they're not supposed to talk about UFOs either. But uh, but yeah, the diverting flights is is a dead giveaway because when they divert, they always divert to a flat map trajectory. And, it's, but again, because most people don't, you know, it's not in their head. They don't get it. It's like, why would you land in Alaska? They just did. Like, but if you overlay it on a flat map, it's like, oh yeah, it's a straight shot. So there you go. Okay. Well, thank you. That's a great answer. All right. Professor Mulder, by, by the way, we've got to say thank you very much to Transamerica Life Insurance Company for sponsoring this great podcast. And Professor Mulder, Dr. Mulder, do you have another question for Mark Sargent? Well, um, now that we're in the second half of the show, I, I thought this might be of interest. I don't know, should we discuss the, the experiment that, uh, uh, that you and I were talking about for, I guess, for several days now, if not several weeks, concerning... Um, absolutely, we should. And, and, I, and I think Mark 
is probably going to be able to an- provide some answers, but we will soon get real answers to this experiment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, Mark, here is the experiment. Okay. Uh, because of what I do, I've always referred to the double slit experiment um, as the reason why these mach- my machines work. You know, I go into a lot of detail about what I do, but uh, and so basically, it, it's sort of like uh, if something is not observed or measured, it sort of behaves like energy. In other words, it exists but it doesn't exist. It has the potential to become reality or, or something real, tangible stuff. Until, but until it is actually observed or measured, it, it's sort of in limbo. We'll just go with that. And and so, uh, my question here is: Now we have. I'm going to describe the experiment. We'll go from and we can go from there. All right. Numerous times I've seen on the on a strange world, for example, and I'll, and uh, I think even Dave Weiss has, has uh, you know referred to this about watching a ship travel on the horizon and uh, according to the uh, the round earth people that ship is going to disappear from sight due to the fact that it is dropping down uh, on the other side of your point of view due to the curvature of the earth yeah all right a, the flat earthers say that with the proper optics with the proper magnification you can watch that ship uh, far far longer or see it far or further than you would uh, expect to because, uh, you know, because uh, you have magnification and it's a level plane, the earth or the, the ocean is minus, you know, because even though it has waves, it has variables here, right. but for all intents and purposes, it's a flat surface. Right. Okay, so you should be able to see that, that ship for miles and miles and miles. All right, now my experiment is have two... Uh, whether it's uh, what is the uh, camera they always refer to the Nikon 500? Or no, uh, the P uh, the P one P one thousand. Okay, the P one thousand. All right, so you have two P one thousands side by side. Right. Okay, and on one camera, we'll have, for example, Karen D, who is a firm believer in the flat Earth. Mm-hmm. On the other side, on the other camera. We will have uh, somebody who believes in a round earth. Uh, for example, uh, I have an engineer, as I referred to earlier, who uh, you know has dealt with satellites, that kind of thing, and he's a firm believer in the round earth. All right, we have both these, uh, these participants in this, in this experiment side by side. We have a ship that's coming out of a harbor. I was thinking Charleston, South Carolina, because uh, ships coming in and out of that harbor all the time. What they could do is have both cameras focus on that ship. All right, so if if Karen B is correct and it's a flat earth, that's, she should be able to see that ship far beyond uh, what uh, is calculated as it disappearing from sight due to the curvature of the earth. Sure. All right? Sure. The other guy, he, all right, the other guy, he could do some simple, you know, calculations. He can figure, okay, this, this ship is going to go a certain a uh, certain uh, distance, and by the time it gets that distance, it's going to disappear just because of the curvature. Right. All right. Karen, uh, okay, so we got Karen, we got my engineer. All right, both side by side. Uh-huh. Now, if Karen is right, again, we're going to see the ship going further. Uh, if the engineer is right, we're going to see the ship disappear as calculated on paper. Okay. All right. So I, I look at it as three possibilities here. There's three possibilities. Number one, Karen is right, and the ship continues, and we're in, you know, in view. Yeah. Number two, she is wrong, but the engineer is right, and the ship disappears as calculated. Sure. Number three, one sees the ship, the other doesn't. Okay. Now, okay, now my question to you, do you see any holes in this experiment, and what would you change for this experiment to, I mean, just get down and dirty, have some real professional people involved in this, have, you know, they're both using identical equipment, 
and they're point and they're both pointed at the same object. What would you do? Uh, what would you change on this experiment, or how? What do you think of it? Um, I I like it. I like it. We we've done a number of uh, similar types of those experiments over the years. So just so I'm clear here, both basically have the same cameras, but they're shooting from either both either opposite sides of the body of water. No, they're no, shooting they're from the same. They're shooting side. from the same okay, both... same side, and same? yeah. Yeah, say there were like. An oh no, I I get I get what you're saying. So one's one's pro, one's con. He makes a prediction. He says I think it's going to disappear at this point. Uh, and of course you're going to have to have you know you, use you know even though I don't want to use it use it'll work. Uh, use GPS on the boat because it won't be that far away from shore. Uh, you know, so at least you know how far away it is. Uh, that's that's all the only recommendation <laughs> recommendation I would make. Uh, make sure whoever's the the con guy has his math in order because you know he's gonna want to throw throw out some math and say okay it's gonna be gone at let's say the ship is oh 20 feet tall he'll say it's gonna be gone by at least you know it, it over the curvature eight inches per mile per mile uh, let's say five to ten miles depending on atmospheric conden- uh, uh, conditions uh, he'll probably he'll probably give a little bit of a range. Uh, but but then again, depending on the light of the day. But yeah, if they're side by side, uh, you know, we let's put it this way. I kind of already know how this is going to turn out because I put this challenge out there a long time ago, and I mean years, where I said, you know, we, as we got more better and better, because the clues had nothing to do with sending people down to the beach with cameras. But pe- that's the first thing did. Most people that get into flat Earth, that's the first thing they do is they go down to the beach with cameras and start shooting long distance. Uh, but I put a challenge out there. I said, find me an object we can't see. It's not It's not that Karen won't be able to see it. She will be able to see it, depending, again, depending on you know the temperature of the day and barometric pressure and, and heat and all that stuff. Uh, usually, you should probably shoot early in the morning mm-hmm. because if, once the heat starts coming up, pff, all bets are off. Because uh, you know then there's all sorts of things happening in the atmosphere. Because remember, kids, what we're breathing in now is not nothing. It's 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen, give or take some trace gases. So, uh, but, but again, there's almost nothing you can't see. Cause I said, find me an object, you know, even at 50 or 70 miles, given decent light conditions that we can't see, find me a lighthouse, find me a, a series of boats. Uh, there's a wonderful video on my channel. You might want to take a look at it be- before you do this experiment to see if it might alter what you're thinking of, uh, called the black swan experiment shot down in, uh, Santa Barbara, California. Which was great, you know, at oil rigs, stationary objects at six and ten miles, and what was amazing when it was a shot. I think it was shot eh, early evening, or I can't remember exactly when. It could have been morning, but it didn't really matter. I, 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 you know what? I don't think it was sunset. Um, but when you're looking at it, not only are the oil rigs not chopped off. That's not the part that blows people away. What's amazing is is you see the oil rig fully at six feet or six miles, one at ten miles. And then you see the horizon behind both of them way off in the distance. Well, that's a problem because the horizon can't be in front and behind simultaneously. So, I mean, I, I have yet to have a science to, scientist come at me with anything uh, regarding that video. Uh, the closest anyone came was a scientist says, no, 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 no. Both of those are the illusions, right? The, the, the one in front and behind are both illusions. The real horizon's invisible. I'm not kidding you. That's, that's what he told me. It's like, okay, okay. Even if, even if you couldn't make that one fly, how in the world are you going to uh, impress that on any audience at all? So, yeah, I like the test. Absolutely. It, it's, it's a good test only because what you're talking about there, and we have not done that sort of test. The closest we came to what you're talking about was the Salton Sea experiment, when we had our cameras and on the same beach looking across nine miles of a salt lake down in uh, outside to the uh, to the east of Los Angeles and National Geographic had their cameras right next to ours. And what was happening was the, the whole theory was they had balloons on the shoreline of the beach across from it. And they were going to raise the balloons until they could finally see them. It's like, well, because you can't see them from the beach because they're on the other side of the curve. And with our can, mm-hmm. and but the thing was they couldn't. They were having a hard time spotting where their people were because you know that all the desert looks the same over there. There's no buildings or anything. There's no points of reference. However, we found the balloons, and they were on the beach, 
And they're like, uh, you, you can't see them on the beach. It's like, oh, hell, we can't. There they are right there. And they scrubbed the, the, that whole part and tested the show. I mean, we shot for hours. We live streamed because we knew what would happen. And they, they turned out not to use that segment because there was no way they could rationalize it for the, te- the television show. So they had to fall back to a make-believe secondary test with a little raft at two miles, which was just ridiculous. Anyway, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I think this this will, it, you know, I, the more I think about this, I think this may raise more questions than it does answers, number one. Sure. Um, yeah, again, I've already talked to the engineer about this experiment, and he says, well, I've been on the coast all the time. I've, I've taken pictures. I've, I've viewed these uh, ships through uh, telescopes, yada, 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 and they always disappear as predicted due to the curvature. And I said, okay, all right, great. And uh, I, I even told him about the, this experiment, and he's, I mean, he's all for it. I just don't see how you could go wrong with this. I mean, for, you know, we're, all we're going to do is call, you know, uh, math that's easily available, that is world, you know, it's accepted by the world, okay, it's being correct, about, you know, eight inches square. Yeah. I mean, we got all that. We have that to work with. We have real math to work with. We're, we're going to use their math, right. so to speak. And um, and so I don't see how that's going to be an issue. Right. Now, the reason why I even question this at all, this this is, and I think I mentioned this on the last time you were on, is when Karen B was over in uh, Europe and they were able to uh, see a laser, shoot a laser straight across a lake, forty miles, and I think roughly they figured the curvature, was, you know, the other side that the other shore should have been approximately eight hundred feet below their their point of view or right. their line of sight. Yeah. And so, um, and so, uh, I mean, what they saw, I thought that, that, that just fascinated the living hell out of me. Yeah. And then I see another guy over in Salt Lake City, Utah, goes to Salt Lake, all right? He's 20 miles away. He's got GPS. Again, he's figuring out where it is, you know, send his laser and his points, cameras, all this other stuff. Yeah. Okay. And the shore was like uh, from one point to the other was 20 miles straight across the lake. He, you know, he uses a telescope for some kind of magnification, and he's able to see the structures that are on the other shore, 20 miles away, and the long, the tallest structure there was like 225, 230 feet. Well, according to the math, that should, you know, at maximum, maximum, you may be able to see the very top of that of that uh, tower, that structure is on the other shore. But no, he saw from the shoreline all the way up to the very top of that tower. Which, if, if the, you know, if curvature is correct in this scenario, that's impossible. Yeah, and and let me let me clarify real quick for the listeners who don't know what we're talking about. The the curvature you know has to be measured, and yes, I know because it eventually goes vertical. You know the you know curve you know turns into um, you know uh, turns into you know, goes off the edge vertical. That eventually you'd have to have some more complex math than eight inches per mile squared. However, most of your math people agree that anything less than 500 miles, eight inches per mile squared, that works perfectly fine because 99% of our observations occur under 500 miles. So there you go. Mm-hmm. So I, mean, I mentioned that because there, right. there you will be well, you will be called on that. Some math people will say, "Well, the the curve isn't exactly eight inches per mile squared," and then you come back and say, "Well, what is it?" It's like, "Well, I can't tell you. I'd have to draw. I have to write it all out." It's like, "Well, it's got to be something, right?" It's like, "No, because it gets more fuzzy <laughs> as as with further distance." It's like, yeah, that's why we cap it at five hundred miles. So anyway, mm, interesting. Yeah. And I'm assuming, you know, the results of the experiments, could you give some examples of people who have done basically the same thing I'm talking about by actually, you know, tracking um, a, a ship or, or a boat or whatever on the, on the ocean or on a lake or what have you, what their results have been? Could you tell the audience? Uh, yeah, just about every test that we've done. I know we've done a lot of tests where we put GPS on a boat. Uh, but we but we could pr- approximate the distance usually by uh, stationary objects like oil rigs and stuff that, that the boat was right next to. We could we could get pretty close. But every observation we've done, every single one, and really what's changed the game is HD photography. You could we wouldn't even be having this conversation 25 years ago. Uh, what's basically happened is HD technology, computer technology, has gotten advanced enough to where they can. But basically, computers cameras are just computers now. And with digital zoom, which is enhanced zoom, 
images that you wouldn't be able to see or take Im pictures of back in the you know day you can now get very very clearly so beforehand yeah in fact to your friend it's like oh i've seen the ships go off on the horizon and look on sails yeah sure you have sure but that's only because you didn't have the tech to see what we can see now uh now you know you can take a um uh, a p1000 or a 950 or a 900 or whatever you know anything just off the rack and with 80 power digital zoom you can crank up you know these boats which are way 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 off in the distance which you cannot see with the naked eye in fact even with the camera you can't see with normal zoom you crank it up and oh yeah there's the boat it's back in frame and then it goes off into the distance like oh no no, no i'll crank up the zoom some more hey it's back in frame and people say well what does that make any difference well Think of it this way. If the Earth is curved, then eventually whatever that object is has to be on the other side of the curve, has to be behind the curve, has to be on the other side of the hill. You can't see on the other side of a mountain. But when it comes to looking across the water, we can now. If, you know, unless it's flat. That is either one of two things. Either we can see things that, you know, our technology is, has gone beyond space age or the, the curvature, which should be there, isn't. And that again, that again, that's what convinces most people. They can, we can see much, much further. And it's not just boats; it's anything across a body of water. H however, w one more caveat, which is, because people will come back. It's like, well, if that's true, then why can't we see Japan from California, and why can't you see France from New York, and why can't you see Mount Mount Everest from everywhere? Because you know, Mount Everest is the is the highest place you know in the world. And it's like, well, for the same reason you can't see underwater forever. You know, a whale goes away even 200 yards. You can't see it anymore because of the thickness of the water. You know, what we're breathing in here right now is just a thin version of water. So, you know, in in a it, with 80 percent, you know, uh, nitrogen to 20 percent oxygen, it's going to get thicker and thicker. So what you're breathing in right now is only 99.9 percent .9 transparent. But however, if you took it away, if, the, if you somehow were looking through a long distance in a vacuum, oh yeah, you would be able to see it. Uh, all you need is the lens to pull that off. So, there you go. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting, Mark. Yeah. Um, well, I tell you what, we're going to, we're going to like put this in, you know, we're working on a book now. And these are great answers to some questions. Chris Chastain, do you have one last question for Mark? I, I do. Um, just uh, with the nature of the subject, and I, I'm going to I'm going to guess I know the answer to this. But do you sometimes uh, do you sometimes feel like you get shut down? talking about this uh oh uh you know whether it's on podcast or sure or wherever it may be sure okay sure you bet you bet i do however most of the podcasts i do when people contact me they're, they're generally fairly curious um uh, i feel bad for like david weiss mm -hmm. because david weiss's people reaches out to the podcasters and when he finds somebody, it's like, hey, you want to talk about Flat Earth? And they're like, oh, oh we're going to light him up. Yeah, we want to talk about Flat Earth. Bring him on. <laughs> and he gets a lot more hostile um, stuff than I do. However, when it comes to, you know, being shut down, I don't, you know, there. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a, a journalist down in um, New Zealand, and he put me out. And he, he wanted to torture me. So he put me in the hot sun. He was in the shade. <laughs> and he was grilling me for like 40 minutes. And some of the questions were tough, but he was, he, yeah, I could tell he was trying to get a rise out of me. You know, he was using profanity, he was cutting me off, he was doing all the, the normal tricks. And at some point, he, he, he paused the interview, he was, cut, 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 cut. He's looking at me, he's going, I don't get it, man. He goes, he goes, I can't, I can't get you to snap. He goes, why, why aren't you getting angry mm -hmm. at me, right? And I'd say, well, because five years ago, I was you. They would be hypocritical for me to to lash out at you. I was like, look, I was on the other side of the fence. Everybody was. I if somebody walked in, you know, ten mm -hmm. ten years ago, if somebody would have walked in the room, it's like, hey, if I'm a flat earther. Talk to me. I would have been like, <laughs> yeah, I'd avoid that man at all costs. But but now I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. So I I've got to, you know, there's some reverse empathy there. You know, I I look at these you know, everybody and and what I try to tell people is like, look, I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to just put the idea in your head. You've got to work it out for yourself. And that's the most dangerous thing. 
because which is why we have like a 99% retention rate. Once you get into our mm-hmm. circles, into our camp, you're done. You can't go back, which is why we use the whole red pill, blue pill thing more than more than most. Um, it's very similar to the Matrix in that regard, where if you you know when you're when you are out of the Matrix, how do you get back in, right? How how, how do you adjust your mind? If you were the one that tore down the globe yourself, then how how do you even begin to expect to uh, to put it back together? Now we've had people that have you know gotten really excited and made content and then you know pulled back, but they never you know never mm-hmm. left the uh, the the community. So no, I don't I don't mind trying you know when people try to shut me down at all because I expect it. In fact, if you don't laugh at flat Earth in the first ten minutes, there's probably something wrong with you. So I'm, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> everybody, everybody should hate this. Where I mean, I've had call-in shows where people are like going, oh "My God, are you insane?" You know, uh, most most people don't ask about my level of edu- education. You know, I come off as as somewhat educated, so I you know I don't sound like you know I'm completely clueless, but I get it. You know, I I get it. It's it's a weird paradigm shift. And again, for any you guys know, real quick, I don't want to drag this out. Which is when it comes to major paradigm shifts, the first response is always the same, which is denial, straight up. You know, it is. De- you know, it's yeah. like no way. There is no way that every could, time. Yeah, and it's it's the most predictable of all responses. You know, I even gave it to Neo in the beginning. It's denial followed by anger, followed by bargaining, followed by depression, followed by you cave in. And some, I mean, it, again, if you don't, women actually respond uh, quicker than men. In this regard, because they're they're not quick to anger when it comes to this. Now they may say no way, you know they'll be skeptical, but it's it's a it's an interesting open minded thing, which is why I encourage people not to look at it. And that's not reverse psychology. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's it was the first paragraph <laughs> of my my last book, which is like look. And the reason I say this is once you go, it, there's a point of no return. So once you go down this rabbit hole for a certain, if you like your life the way it is, and you just like wake up every day, thumbs up, don't do it. Because once you get past that certain point, you can't come back. There, you can't unwind this. So, there you go. It's a blessing and a curse. It's cool to 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 know about it, but when you know about it, it's like, oh man, I- ignorance is bliss. <laughs> anyway, yes. <yeah. so. laughs> Very well put. Thanks. Well, 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 I'll tell you what, Mark. You have been an amazing guest. Thank you. And we are looking forward to putting together this book that you and I and Brad Mulder and the whole group are, are putting together. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna turn some heads. All right. Don't you agree? I you you let me know what I can do to help. I am more than happy to. Well, just you being here, and so can we have you back again in a couple of weeks? I don't think so. This has been nope. absolutely. Yep. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. Damn it! You one shot deal. <laughs> You're amazed. I'm amazed. I haven't hung up yet. No, no, absolutely. You bet. You bet. Just last. You let me know and remind me, and uh, I will. I will be here. Sure. Well, look, look. Thank you very much because it's been wonderful. I wanted to say thank you very much from the heart of Scary Cast. Because this is what we're about. We're about questions and answers. And I'll tell you what, you've had a lot of answers. And I really appreciate them. As, as the founder of ScaryCast, you have given us answers that are amazing. So I wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you. And um, we're going we're gonna to sign off now. And I want everybody to say goodbye. 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 Adios. Good night, everybody. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Hello, Daisy. Hello, Maggie.